also adding an oxygen. But now we're going to add an oxygen where the, a carbon connects with a double bond to the oxygen. And in this case, therefore, we're going to add a point of unsaturation. Remember, unsaturation means it's lacking hydrogen, or another way of thinking about it is that there are multiple bonds in the molecule. All right? So, um, again, let's start with methane. CH4, our simplest hydrocarbon. And again, let's draw the structure there. There is methane. Now what we want to do is we want to add an oxygen, but we have to add a carbon-oxygen double bond. So therefore, we have to lose two hydrogens, and we have to add an oxygen. And when we do that, we come up with an arrangement that looks like this. So there we've gotten rid of two of the hydrogens, and we're going to replace those two hydrogens with a carbon-oxygen double bond. Okay? Again, notice that everybody's happy here. Hydrogen's got its one valence, its pair of valence electrons. The carbon has four pairs of valence electrons, and the oxygen has formed two bonds, and it's, it has its four pairs of valence electrons or eight valence electrons. So now we've introduced a new functional group, okay? And that new functional group is characterized by this carbon-oxygen double bond combination right here. And we call that the carbonyl group. By itself, it's not a functional group, but it appears in several different functional groups. Okay? A lot of equal signs there. So but when, I when we talk about a carbonyl group, a carbonyl group by itself is not a functional group, but what is connected to the carbonyl group makes it a functional group. All right? So, um, Let's go, let's go on, let's go up, let's go to, uh, let's now go to C2H6, okay, again, we can draw that, there's our hydrocarbon, and I hope everybody's saying to themselves, that's ethane, and probably don't really need to draw that, but it's helpful. And now we're going to do the same thing we did before, we're going to take out two hydrogens, and we're going to add one oxygen, and again, we do that. We've got a, some choices here, okay. but in any event, I take away the two hydrogens, replace the two hydrogens with an oxygen with a double bond. All right, so there's a, another example. And then let's do one more, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the differences here. So now if we start with C2H6, we can go to C3H8, and again, Take a moment to just sketch that out. I know you're saying to yourself, you really don't need to do that. We know how to do that, but it helps. Good practice. Can't practice this enough. Again, in order to insert our new functional group, we're going to take away two hydrogens. We're going to add an oxygen. And now, notice we've got two possibilities. I can, just like I did in the previous case, I can come along all of my hydrogens, except on that last carbon, I'm going to pop off two hydrogens, replace those two hydrogens with an oxygen. All right? Another possibility is, I hope you've seen that, is to pop two hydrogens off that middle carbon and replace those two hydrogens with a double bond oxygen. All right. I hope everybody can see the difference between these two molecules. Let's focus in on these. Okay. So in this case, okay, I've got a carbon connected to the carbon oxygen double bond connected to a hydrogen. In the second case, how does it differ? Well, pretty subtle, but it's definitely different. In that case, I have carbon on both sides of the carbon wheel. So these two functional groups, these are two different functional groups. They both contain the carbonyl group, but they're different depending upon what's connected. Okay? If there is a hydrogen connected to one side of that carbonyl group, that is called an aldehyde. So aldehydes always have a carbon connected to the carbonyl group, the carbon-oxygen double bond group, 
and there's always a hydrogen here. Okay. The other group is called a ketone. Ketones differ because instead of having a hydrogen connected to one side, they have carbons connected to both sides. Okay. So aldehydes are always going to appear on the outside of a molecule because they end at a hydrogen. We sometimes call an aldehyde a dead end group. Hope that makes sense to you. Aldehydes are always going to be at the end or on the outside because they terminate with a hydrogen. Ketones, on the other hand, are bridges. They are carbon bridges. So they are more likely to be found somewhere in the middle of the molecule. All right. So in terms of general formulas, aldehydes look like this. Aldehydes have a carbon group. Again, remember R designates a carbon group connected to that carbon-oxygen double bond, which is then connected to a hydrogen. So the key here is there's always a hydrogen on one side of that carbonyl. That's our aldehyde. Okay? So aldehydes you can think of only grow in one possible direction by adding carbon to this side. This side of the aldehyde is fixed. Okay. Ketones have carbon groups on both sides. So again, we'll use this term that we'll use this R sub A, where that represents a carbon group. Connected to that carbon oxygen double bond. connected to another carbon group that can be different and therefore oops can't spell today we use the R sub B okay so notice the difference between aldehydes and ketones subtle difference ketones all ketones already have carbon groups on both sides aldehydes have carbon groups only on one side and hydrogen on the other side okay so that's a little bit about aldehydes and ketones. Aldehydes and ketones tend to sol solvents, um, and they also are flavorings. So for example, the flavor of cinnamon is an aldehyde. Uh, the simplest ketone, which is the one up here, which is called acetone, is a common solvent used in nail polish remover. Okay. Ketones tend to end in the name own. Own, okay. Aldehydes end in AL. All right.